successfully as I'm sure balancing all of this, as well as with distance learning or high the new norm. So as they go through all these changes, what's so important is to pivot and flex in a positive way without uh, losing sight of what's important or meaningful for you. So today we have our fellow alum, Jesse, and my friend. Uh, we're both graduated the same class. He's gonna be sharing his journey uh, from engineering to designer and sharing his tips on how pivoting and embracing a growth mindset can help us define and even redefine our own dream job. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, let me share my screen. Cool. Thumbs up. Good. Awesome. All right. And first off, hello. Um, like Jennifer said, um, I'm a proud ICS alum. I graduated class of 2003. And even more so, I was uh, formerly involved with the ICS alumni chapter. So it, it's definitely a pleasure to be uh, back and sharing my story with you all today. Um, and, and for today's Lunch and Learn, uh, as a quick summary, I want to share my personal story. I don't think I've ever told this in a different context, uh, uh, my, my whole story about how I navigated from going engineering and getting into design from engineering. Um, and in the process, I wanted to share kind of the, uh, some of the insights um, and and how kind of refining my definition of a dream job really helped me uh, navigate that. So let's begin. Um, so brief intro on what I do today. I am a director of product design at LinkedIn, designing consumer products. It's where I've been for almost uh, nine years, past nine years, almost a decade. And chances are, if you've used LinkedIn at all in the past decade, you've probably come across work that I've worked on, uh, me and my team. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but uh, I wanted to kind of kick off with what, what is this growth mindset? Um, and maybe show of hands, people have people heard of this concept before? Is this a familiar concept or first time hearing it? Um, or I got a couple of thumbs ups. Cool. I, I think it's a pretty popularized concept, whether it's in business management or if you heard um, CEO of Microsoft Satya, this is one uh, management philosophy he really embraced uh, for all of Microsoft. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go over what it is and what it isn't. Um, and I think it's really easy to talk about growth mindset when we talk about the opposite, which is a fixed mindset. So what is a fixed mindset? Uh, it, it's perceiving challenges as obstacles. Intelligence is static. Learning stops at a certain point in our lives. We're focused only on the output and not the journey. And failure is a state. And as you can imagine, growth mindset is almost the complete opposite of that. It's a reframing of all this, reframes challenges uh, as something that you might enjoy. Uh, intelligence is something you can develop. And learning is continuous. It's a lifetime, a lifelong journey. And uh, it's, it's, it's less about the output. It's all about the effort. And lastly, failure is learning rather than a state. So that's kind of a 30, se 30 second elevator pitch on what growth mindset is. Uh, but we'll, we'll come back to kind of how that is relevant. So first, want to go through a time machine. This is a kind of a linear story of my journey, starting off with graduating ICS with Jen and other folks in the room. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a very. Uh, I can remember there was so much pressure to just kind of get a job because the economy was um, not doing so well, and it was a very tough program. And I remember clearly uh, what the fail-safe uh, dream job definition was at the time. And typically it kind of goes in, in, in like a, a Venn diagram uh, of sorts, right? When you, you define, okay, first a dream job, it's gotta pay, pay you well. You gotta be good at doing it. 
And lastly, you need to enjoy doing it. So this is something that I went for at the time and that it really meant trying to find something that is in that concentric circle there. And I'll just call this like version one of what I consider a dream job. Um, and off I go. And um, finally, I found my first gig out of school. I was so elated to have a job, number one, but also that it's a household brand. I worked at Philips and people know Philips. Um, I, I learned so much working here. I spent about two years there. Um, I was developing front end, back end, middle tier. And one thing I really got out of that experience is this versatility in, in crossing over all these different uh, technical layers. Um, but something that was, um, that I wanted to overcome is I, I felt the fear of being obsolete um, as a technical uh, engineer. And I think this is like the fixed mindset creeping in. Like, how do I keep up? How do I always learn the latest and greatest? That actually led me to moving uh, to a consultancy. So this consultancy is called Avanade. And it, it, it seemed like a perfect step for my career, working still as a software engineer, but working with new clients, le learning new technologies, travel, experiencing different verticals and industries, working with different functional areas. Um, and what, I, what was most um, kind of incentivizing to me is that the company is willing to invest in upskilling me because being a consultant meant that the more skills I had, the more marketable it was for the company. So that it really aligned well in terms of uh, allowing me to be in a situation where I continuously learn. And out of here, uh, I worked with a bunch of big brands, um, Gateway Computer, State Farm, Pacific Life, uh, Edna, Autobytel, Microsoft, uh, I wanted to, this was my first interaction with Microsoft. Um, and um, it was actually at Microsoft, I learned about UX and piqued my interest. And I wanted to work much closer with it. Never thought about being a designer at this point, um, but just, it felt like that was something that piqued my interest. Um, I, I, I liked it so much that I actually turned down a promotion opportunity to relocate to headquarters, um, but wanting to head more closer to UX. So this brings me to the first insight I wanted to share with you all today. Uh, and this was, I, I got this from a creative director I came across, his name is New. And the insight is the closest job to your dream job is the job you have. Meaning that I think there's a misconception that once you quit your current job in order to find your dream job, um, if you decided to do something else. Um, your current job, my, my thesis is your current job is actually where you can start making practical steps to where you want to go. So it's actually the closest job to your dream job. And kind of similarly, uh, it was at uh, Avanade and working with Microsoft that I was exposed to UX and that led to me telling my manager at the time, I wanted to do more UX work, wanted to do more front end work. And I was exposed to more of the design discipline um, and, and learning about that. And that just made me hungry, hungrier for more. That eventually led me to um, finding out about this really boutique digital agency called Identity Mind. And they specialize in designing and building apps. Um, I think a fun side note here is they actually sought me out through LinkedIn. So this is kind of part of my overall LinkedIn story, only because I was part of a LinkedIn group um, that I know a certain front end technology. Um, and someone from that company reached out to me. And a um, significant uh, thing I learned here is I was working alongside with a bunch of UX creatives that was so different from where, where I was before. Um, and also new job titles, right? Um, I was look, working with people that have titles like information architects, 
visual designers, researchers, even myself had finally had UX in my job title. So that was very exciting. UX integrator, it could have been anything. Um, I was still doing the same work that I was doing, but it, it just felt I was getting closer. And just to shed some light of like what I primarily worked on there, I was working on the surface, like back then when it was a big table, not a tablet. And this was before there was an iPhone. Um, and building apps for this giant table was a lot of fun. Um, and, but, but we all know uh, it didn't take off. It didn't have commercial success. And uh, in retrospect, most of it was proof of concepts and sales pitches. But in the process, it did make me become even more curious about the design, the design of this piece of hardware. Uh, why didn't it take off like the iPhone did? Why did it fail? Why did some of our apps fail? How do we make meaningful software that people will like? How do we create the sense of wonder? Uh, when, when I was working with uh, projects with the Surface team, they talk about the sense of like a wow moment, a wow factor for every app. How do you create that? How do designers do this almost on demand? And that was just a huge curiosity to me. Eventually I had to scratch that itch, that, that hunger for design knowledge eventually led me to look into attending design school. This is a picture of Margaret uh, Morrison Hall of Carnegie Mellon. Um, I, I really had, this was my top choice and I really only applied to um, this program and maybe one other. And not because I was so confident, but I was confident that I, I wouldn't get in. So I shouldn't waste my time. Um, but I just thought, why not? Um, let's, I, I wanna give it a shot. Uh, but long story short, I did get in and it was a very competitive program uh, of 20 students and of which 10 were only 10 were studying interaction design. And uh, needless to say, I think my time there was transformational and I was able to uh, gain a lot of practical design knowledge and got hands-on experience doing design. I finally built my first portfolio of work that contained work that I designed and not I, something I collaborated uh, as an engineer from another designer. And I, uh, I was able to land an internship at YouTube, eventually taking a full-time job at LinkedIn. And I think this leads to my second insight, I, I, I think uh, as a takeaway, is that our experience is our unique differentiator. Um, and uh, another misconception as we're trying to cross over to some other fields, we often think our previous field of expertise is not relevant. And case in, case in point is when I applied to Carnegie Mellon, I thought I needed to look more like a designer and less about uh, less like an engineer. And I thought they were looking for people that are like designers. But I didn't realize this in retrospect that diversity of thought was such an important part of everything and design especially and um, I might have only gotten in because I was so different from the other candidates. And I think this continues to ring true in just uh, my day-to-day -day work and um, kind of the, the professional environment we're in. Um, so yeah, never kind of never lose sight of our, our past experience here. So jumping back to our dream job version, um, I linked in, I was intru introduced a slightly refined version of this by our former CEO, Jeff Weiner, um, of what it means to be working at your dream job. And uh, he defined, um, I kind of reframed, instead of getting paid well, it's important that we dream big. Um, and instead of being good at something, it's about getting shit done. And enjoy, I think this kind of pretty much stays the same, having fun. So now if this is version two of what I consider a dream job. And I think this is very exemplary of like maybe Silicon Valley is about, it's about execution. It's about dreaming big and it's about having fun all at the same time. And this really, um, I would categorize a, a lot of my time at LinkedIn uh, felt this way. Now kind of zooming into the more, more of the present, um, 
where I, I am uh, at LinkedIn. So I said I, I would jump into some of the work my team has worked on. Um, I, I've worked on my network, profile, messaging, groups, jobs, premium, pages, campaign manager, Elevate. I feel like it, I, the list can go on. I probably missed some things there too. Uh, gone through multiple redesigns. Um, but also I was very fortunate to grow as a, a designer, people manager, and now cross-functional product leader, working with tons of talented folks. Um, but there's so much going on in the world at the same time and it really kind of make me question what's that dream job definition. And to me, really my work right now, most importantly, is designing for equity, trust, and diversity, inclusion, belonging, and creating a sense of community. Um, that becomes uh, the most important aspect. So of course, uh, going jumping back to the dream job definition, um, it's, not, it's no longer about dreaming big, I think, about anything. I think the work needed to be purposeful. My work needed to mean something. Um, so instead of dreaming big, it's, it's about purpose. And uh, instead of getting shit done, it's not just about execution and flawless execution. I think it's about mastery. It's about continuing to learn our craft and be better and pushing myself. Um, and lastly, having fun. I think a different way to say it is having autonomy. And having a, it's more important to have autonomy because this also supports the other two uh, concentric circles here. Um, and fulfill and, and feeling fulfilled and creating a space where I can um, be, um, have mastery in something. So this is the latest version of what I consider what a dream job is. And that leads me to my final insight, uh, which a dream job is actually a process. It's not a destination. There's not one job that we would consider a dream job. I think this it, it will continue to evolve at, um, depending on the time, um, if I can, part advice is, is to continue to seek out what it is that we want and find ways to grow into it. So in closing, I wanted to summarize some of the key takeaways uh, right. when I was coming up with this uh, reflection in my personal story is practice a growth mindset, definitely ditch the fixed mindset um, and start with the job you have and look for opportunities to grow. The job you have has uh, is the closest one to your dream job. And don't underestimate our past experience, even if you're pivoting into something completely different. It's the way it uniquely differentiates all of us. Um, and lastly, your dream job is not, uh, is not a fixed state uh, like we, we kind of started with. Practicing the growth mindset, the dream job is uh, a process, uh, it's, a, it's a journey, and it will continue to evolve as you grow. Um, and that's all I have. So really want to thank you for being here and listening me to, to share my story. I, you know where to find me. I'm on LinkedIn. I encourage you to uh, connect with me. And I'm always happy to meet alums and and uh, have a chat. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, for sharing your uh, your journey with us. It was very interesting. Um, I guess we're open right now um, to any questions. If you guys have any questions uh, for Jesse. Rose Kate. Yeah. Well, uh, Jesse, maybe okay. one question uh, from my side. Um, we can start at the beginning. Why ICS? Why ICS? Um, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I actually, it was, it was. Let me think. Um, I actually got in the school. Uh, I actually majored in math, and then I transferred. So I was always I scored really well in math, um, but unsure what I was going to do with a math major. But I, I think. Um, at the time, we were at like the dot-com bubble almost. Software seemed to be 
uh, uh, there's going to be a huge demand and that's I'm like I, I like I like computers I'm good at math maybe I should try this out so it's very innocent I think in a way that I got in um, but not knowing what would come out of it yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you again, Jesse, for um, all of uh, that information today. And then no other questions. Uh, Actually, I, 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 I got one. Sorry, go yep. ahead. So go ahead. I, I found it interesting that you listed autonomy um, as, as one of the things that made it a dream job, because for me, I've gone the other way. I actually value teamwork and collaboration. What do you think about that? Or it, I mean, is are both important, or or is autonomy really meaning you have the authority to make change? You're not just an individual contributor. Um, I, well, I really appreciate that. I, I think it to me it wasn't exclusive, mutually exclusive, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think autonomy meant that like I have the uh, means to pursue. Um, ideas and make changes to my environment or um, have some freedom to pursue some uh, the things that would line myself up to the, the other goals I have, like uh, purpose and um, mastery, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's on that lens, but never, never do I think it's, it's all about myself because everything we do is is an output of a, a set of creative individuals. So I think autonomy is just putting, putting me in situations where I can do all of those things with others. Okay. Uh, Jesse, one question. So when you um, made the transition from, like a, from engineering and uh, into design, did you, so I, I guess was, was, did you feel like, hey, design is something that I've always that you've always wanted to do, and then you kind of went to it, or um, did you feel like um, uh, going to design was like a, a more of a calculated type move? I would say being in UX was a calculated move. And in some respects, uh, when I was working at Identity Mind, um, I, I, I achieved my goal. But I, I really mean it when I like, it was the hunger for like, I wanna know more, where I'm like, how do I get even more? How do I get further in pursuing to answer the questions that I had uh, based on my experiences? and. And honestly, I, I got into the program, but I didn't think I would come out being a designer. I didn't know what I was going to be, but that was my way of just investing in myself. I will gain a, a ton of new skills. Maybe it'll, it'll just make me a better engineer at the end of the day. I thought about it that way. Mm. Um, so a, a lot of it was like, yeah, I, I have this opportunity to, to try it as a designer. Let me see if I can do it. If not, I think there were also other career paths that were adjacent to being a designer, uh, like being a researcher is, is something that um, came across my mind. And also being a product leader, a product manager is something that came across. So I, I didn't, it, it wasn't like um, I, I knew I wanted to be a designer uh, way back. I drew as a kid, but I, I don't think I never I never thought about it as a as a destination. Um, does that does that answer your question? It it, it does, and and I have a follow up if you don't mind. Um, it, I guess in that transition, did you ever have like that that struggling moment where you're just like, man, I don't know if this is for me, or this is just like way too different that I've been working on, like, and and to kind of have that moment where you're like is this is this what I really want to do did you I mean did you ever have that oh, thought process a hundred percent all the time I got rejected a million times uh, maybe I should have talked about that right but I think <laughs> celebrating celebrating failures as um uh, as learnings like um I think if I were to maybe get a job as a designer without going to school, without furthering myself, maybe I would have skipped that step. Right. Um, but some food as I am. 
Chop Che or something. Oh, sorry, uh, getting yeah. some background. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's 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 getting it's getting um, tons of rejections and um, saying, hey, um, they don't they, they didn't see myself working as a designer based on the experience I had, the knowledge I had. So that definitely was input to kind of continuing continuing my journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's all about just seeing where it led, led me um, and following kind of what the, what the opportunities were. Very cool, thank you. And it looks like Anthony has a question. Hey there, how's it going? Uh, thank you so much for, for joining and, and for, uh, for sharing your story. I was very interested in, um, I almost never click on the emails for these, but uh, for some reason I had to come in and hear you, Jesse. So thank you so much for, um, um, for, for spending time with us. My question is this, so uh, you may have talked about this a little bit in the presentation, but I wonder if you might elaborate a little bit more on the different muscles that you needed to exercise transitioning from engineering to a non-engineering uh, role and focus. What did you, uh, in, in what ways were you sort of tested to use um, skills that maybe as an engineer you might not have uh, needed as much as you do now? Oh, that, that's a very excellent question. I, I think there was, I, deliberately and this still not right now but when i got out of design school companies wanted to hire me to do everything because it just felt like the dream come true right oh you can do front end you can do back end you can do design but actually it doesn't work that way and kind of to maybe jeff's question earlier on this is not a single person show right we need to work with a bunch of multidisciplinary people but for me although my engineering background does help a ton in figuring out cost and feasibility, I, I do need to sometimes shut that off during the design process in order for myself to not think about the constraints because it, the constraints sometimes will pull me back on pushing the envelope, on, 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 on pushing what technology may afford. So there, there was a different, like I have a mental light switch. I'm like, or like a hat change, like, okay, let me think about this. It's almost my internal um, devil's advocate, if you will. It, and like, let's, let's not think like I traditionally think about this. Let, let me put on a different hat and push and push. And I think after years of practice, I, I, that, that is internally managed in a harmonious way where it just turns on when I need it to, it doesn't. And most of the time I actually have on default, I, I like, I let my partners worry about the constraints more so than I do. I trust them to, to kind of keep me in, in, in bounds. Uh, but that understanding does help me uh, provide credibility to my engineering partners because they understand uh, I know how I, I've, I've designed applications, I've developed applications before. So kind of to that end, it all builds up. Um, and um, hope that answers the question. No, it, it doesn't. I had uh, one more follow-up if that's um, if that's okay, or, or perhaps uh, Frank should go first. <laughs> um, but uh, th there's, um, I, I don't know if you're, I imagine you're familiar with Annie uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, from Google who leads, um, uh, the product inclusion team there. I wonder if you might uh, remark on um, whether you know about that work, um, what's appealing about it to you. Um, have you been able to take anything from um, from that or, or from others uh, in the space? I might not have specific uh, familiarity with what you're referencing there. Um, so I'll connect Maybe. on LinkedIn and send you a link. How about that? Yeah, we're already connected, Anthony. If you don't know, oh. I, I I heard you talk uh, before. So okay, yeah, definitely <laughs> worth a follow up there. Fantastic! I'll make sure to do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like we have a question uh, from Frank. Um, what do you think of CAD as design? CAD a CAD as 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 in the kind of the industrial design software. Um, Frank, do you want to elaborate on what, what do you mean by that? 
is it more like is that activity considered design or hi, hi jesse uh hi so i i put the question in the chat so the the uci ICS Alumni Bay Area has had meetings at Autodesk in San Francisco with uh, presentations on AI and machine learning used in design uh, to uh, interestingly come up with designs which uh, are better solutions for some optimizations, but no human ever thought of them. <laughs> ah. So. Uh, do you have any thoughts about this this direction of design? I see, I see. So it, it's more it, it's maybe maybe less about CAD, but more around like the role AI and ML plays in product design. Does that does that? Yeah, is that yeah. Right so this on? is uh, machines as designers, right. given a set of you know uh, goals and constraints. Yeah, this is very top of mind, and I can speak maybe from just our, my experience at LinkedIn because ultimately AI, machine learning algorithms are driving a lot of our products experiences nowadays. Um, but we know sometimes we get it right and we almost always get it wrong. <laughs> um, it, it's only good for um, the cases that we anticipate and the things that it's seen so far. But the, the role of design in that is really making sure that we create equitable and ethical experiences. It's really designing the environment and the process in which we evaluate AI and ML. Uh, at least that's the stage uh, I've been exposed to from LinkedIn and Microsoft. So there's, there, there, it, we just need to have a much higher quality bar in terms of uh, what, is, what is a good output and, and what is not. Um, but the, the technology itself, like you said, it, it is, it is machine driven. So I think it's putting intentionality around the environment, which this thing is situated and that is a design activity. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other additional questions? Uh, what's the next big thing from LinkedIn? <laughs> We've got lots of things going. Um, we we have we have we almost launch products daily uh, or weekly every three days. Um, so, um, but we we typically line up big announcements. Um, if I were to summarize, yeah, uh, definitely don't get me fired. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I I think we're 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 making uh, we're making a lot of tools for creators. Uh, if I may summarize, I think that's a that's a big theme for uh, social media in general. Um, um, and so I, I probably could just leave it at that. Uh, so people, uh, are, we are increasingly seeing people make a living uh, creating content. And um, LinkedIn uh, provides distribution and also tools for them to reach a professional audience. So we're, we're doing a lot of, a lot of work in that space right now. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to plus one that because that as, as someone who's used um, LinkedIn quite a bit to build platform, uh, it's it, it ain't Twitch, but <laughs> there could be, um, I think, more to do, uh, more that can be done to support um, creators. That, that use, I'm, again, that's just my two cents. I'm just a guy that, that loves using LinkedIn. Um, but thinking thinking around a, a, a thoughtful design for that that doesn't um, Drag LinkedIn down to the level of some of the other social networks. Um, I, I, that's got to be a tough challenge. Yeah, completely with you. What's it like doing that under Microsoft now? Oh. Uh, to be honest, not a whole lot different. Um, I, I think it, it feels like we, we have autonomy uh, as a company. Um, but now we are, we are supported by this one of the, the biggest software companies in the world. Um, and we have access to technology that would be unimaginable uh, in, in the past if, when we were um, a standalone company. So um, I think in retrospect, it, it, was, it was the best thing that could happen to LinkedIn. 
but at the time, I, and I, I worked through the time, it was very scary because we didn't know what would happen. Thank you again, Jesse, for joining today's uh, Lunch and Learn. And then just a friendly reminder to everyone that we have monthly uh, Lunch and Learns. So if you can join us the first Fridays of each month. Um, the next one we have coming up is a Jackbox game night. And we also have the tech scavenger hunt. And if you uh, or anyone else are uh, wanting to be a speaker for the month, feel free to reach us, reach out to us. And uh, we also put the link here. Uh, feel free to like and um, follow us on social media. Thank you, everyone.